Welcome to Nolan. My name is Pastor Nate. If you're visiting with us, just welcome. If you're watching online, welcome. We're glad that you're here, and our prayer is that you indeed see a family who just loves their father and wants to glorify him with everything that they've got. This is an exciting day, right? Christ has risen. There we go. I love it. As we continue to worship our awesome God through the preaching of his word, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for who you are and what you have done for us. Lord, as we've been reminded, even through our family worship time and through the songs that we are singing, uh, Lord, we cannot even come before you without you first approaching us. Lord, we thank you for what you've done through, for us through your son, Jesus Christ, who stepped down from his throne to die on a Roman cross, to take the punishment that was due for me to us, to absorb your wrath for my treachery, so that anyone who confesses that, Lord, that Jesus Christ is both Lord and Savior will be saved. But not only did you die, Lord, because you did die, but you rose again. And our hope is in that, that you indeed rose again. And amen. Today is Easter, and something that my, well, my parents and their grandkids do is my mom would, well, actually she would get one of my sisters to do it, but she would go around and she would hide Easter eggs around the house. We all have done an Easter egg hunt of some kind, right? And they would go and they would hunt, and some of them would be in easier spots, and some would be in harder spots, and the kids would f uh, spend a few minutes uh, possibly burning off whatever energy they need in order to absorb way more energy with the candy that they're about to eat. And they get some candy out of it, and even more candy, because that's what grandmothers do, right? Hype up your kids and then send them home. It's cruel, unusual punishment for the parents, but that's okay. But like children scattering around the yard or around the house for an Easter egg hunt, you and I, too, are also hunting for something. We all are. We all are hunting. Our thirst souls, our, our thirsty souls are, are rummaging through every nook and cranny of this world and, and everything that this world has to offer to try and satisfy a deep longing and a deep thirst that's within us all. We're all searching for something. We're all looking for something. And we look for all the shiny pleasures and sentimental delights that this world has to offer to try and fill it. It could be anything. And some of it's not all that bad. But if you're that person, if you're that type of person who's, who is putting all their joy into things that get old and fade or rust or break or might be stolen you need to pay very careful attention to what Easter has to say. Because it addresses that question, have you found what you're looking for? It's the type of attention that you need. Not the, uh, the nod off through the sermon kind of attention, but with a real earnest, eager attention that's fixated on the one thing that won't fade, break, be stolen, or rust. If we miss the significance of this day, the resurrection, we scamper past the greatest joy that this universe has. So what are you looking for? As you come to Easter, what are you looking for? Have you found it? The gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. The gospel makes a promise to you and to me today that if we believe in Jesus, if we believe in him, if we take him at his word, if we repent of our sin, our treachery against a holy God, if we acknowledge that we are treacherous against him, if we believe these things, if we believe in Jesus, all our sins will be forgiven and you will live with God forever. And when I mean all, I do mean all. You cannot out -sin God's grace. Isn't this amazing news? 
It's the news that centers on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. If you were to read through the Gospel of Luke or any of the other Gospels, you will see that it's all about Jesus from beginning to end. And here in Luke, as you, if you have your Bibles with you, here in Luke, in Luke chapter 24, which is where we'll be spending our time, verses 1 to 12, we will see two women who go looking for something, but don't find what they are looking for. But they won't be disappointed either. So if you have your Bibles with you, please open them to Luke chapter 24. I'll be reading from chapter 1 to chapter, uh, sorry, verse 1 to verse 12. On Good Friday, we spend time taking a look at the crucifixion and Jesus' death and burial, starting at uh, 23 of chapter, sorry, 26 of chapter 23. But now we're finishing off that story, that Easter story right here in verse 20 of chapter 24, verse 1, which says this, But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that had been prepared, that had been prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returned from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them as idle tale, and they did not believe them. Verse 12, But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping in and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. And this is the word of the Lord. These are great truths and a great reminder. And as we look at this, we're going to be looking at this first point. We're going to be looking at is what the woman found. The first thing we see are women returning to the tomb to finish what they started in the previous chapter. And as we looked at these, we need to ask some questions. What the women find when they went to, what did the women find when they get to the empty tomb? What did the angels say to them when they got there? And how do people respond with this news? Is it faith or is it unbelief? And something that is very interesting that pops out to this, if we go back into chapter 23 and we look at Jesus' burial and the women were there, they did not have time to finish what they started. So they had to come back on Sunday to finish what they started. Do you get that? Do you see God's sovereignty even in this timing? Here a woman who actually thought, and everybody thought that Jesus actually died. That he was dead, buried, done. Whatever they thought was going to happen is now done. But God orchestrates this time so that there's not enough time for them to prepare. But they have to come back. And in coming back, they hear this wonderful message. He is not here. These are things that we need to think about. The woman had watched Joseph of Arimathea take this lifeless body off off of, of the cross and then lay it in this unused tomb. They took careful notes of where the body was laid. They went home to prepare the spices needed to, to fully and properly bury their friend's body. They took their Sabbath rests, waiting a day, and then they go to pay their respects to the teacher, to their loved one. So don't bypass this. The women were never finished their task. They went back to the tomb, and a surprise was waiting for them, as we see in verses 1 to 3. But on the first day of the week, at the early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. It was early dawn, which literally means deep earliness. The military have a saying for this. They call it BMT. 
before morning nautical twilight, which means it's way too early for me. It was before the sun was rising. Earlier than I would ever wish to get up. And we see God's sovereignty happening here. There, there wasn't time to finish, as I was saying, what was done before, what needed to be done. So they had to go back. And God uses this to confront their unbelief and to remind them of the things that Jesus himself actually said earlier. What would you have happened? What would, how, would you have been, how would you have reacted here? This is part of God's plan because it brought the woman back. Good Friday is good, but Easter makes it good. Our Lord rose from the dead. And as they left, what did they expect to ha- see there? They expected to find the very dead body that they held scary to the tomb in the previous chapter. They would have... They would have been closer to that. They would have been able to see that Jesus actually truly died. If you see someone die on a Roman cross, what would you expect to happen? The worst punishment that we could ever know and understand has happened. Mine, if I saw someone die on a cross and I was going to go to their tomb in three days, I would expect a dead body. So when we read this, we're like, oh, how did the woman not get that? Well, they did some forgetting. But I think their expectations were realistic. These women would have expected the end of Jesus' earthly existence. These women came not to praise Jesus, but to bury him. Think about what is running through their minds as they get closer to the tomb with the stone that is rolled away. You and I, we have the benefit of how the story ends. We don't. They didn't. Jesus is triumphant over death through the resurrection of his body. I don't think we understand the depth of their surprise when they walk up to this tomb that had a giant stone rolled over and the stone is no longer there anymore and the tomb is empty. One pastor put it this way, as we consider the state of the Galilean woman, we must not let our knowledge of the glorious revelation that awaits them dull us to the dark sackcloth covering that the that was on these women's souls. They were depressed, exhausted, mourning, with no hope whatsoever. Feel like that ever? How would you react if you saw the body was gone? The body of your friend, your teacher, your loved one? Would it not just add even more bitterness to your heart? It was the shock of their lives. The aftershock that followed the earthquake of the crucifixion. The Jesus who was crucified, died, and buried had now disappeared. In verse 4, it says, While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. They were at a total loss. It simply did not make any sense to them. They could not explain it in their finite mind. They could not explain the fact that they saw someone died. They actually saw the dead body. They put the body in said grave, and now the body's not there. Think about the questions that would have been running through their minds from this weekend. Why did Jesus die the way that he died, suffering the dark approach of the cross? How could someone so alive end up dead? Where was the body that, had, that we had seen? They were still distressed and perplexed. All they could see was the body of Jesus that was not there as they expected it to, to be. And what the woman found is that they could not find Jesus. But what did they find in that empty tomb? which we see with these angels. What did the angels say? In verses 4 to 6, it says, While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Which means they really stood out. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Good question, right? 
He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. See, the women find angels at the empty tomb, and their words help us understand what has happened to Jesus. I love what the angels are saying here. I just, a a bit of a mild rebuke. Just a bit. Verse 5. Why do you seek the living among the dead? here's, imagine this, picture this, right? You got these women, they're carrying all their spices, and it would have been a lot of spices, pounds and pounds and pounds of spices. Maybe some cloth. They're, they're distraught, probably wearing black. They're just depressed and lacking all hope, and here they are, kind of crying. I would imagine that they were silent as they walked to the burial. And then two, two men are bedazzled, standing there and they ask this question why are you seeking the living amongst the dead they fully expected to see jesus dead fully but the angels come and they give this little mild rebuke and what a great question in such a gentle way as saying that the women's assumptions about jesus were so very wrong They assumed that Jesus was dead, which is why they were at the tomb so early in the morning, carrying the oils and the spices for his embalming. They were looking for a corpse. They believed that Jesus was still buried, and therefore they were looking to find him among the dead. Think about this text with me. Good Friday, there was no time to prepare about it. But here God is using time and the resurrection to prove again, once again, that these people have it wrong. Everything was wrong because their premise was wrong. Jesus was not dead at all. Jesus is alive. If Jesus is alive, there was no reason for looking for him where they were looking for him. In verse 6, he is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. They were looking in the wrong spot. Jesus is the living one. He is not dead. No bounds of the bonds of the grave or death could keep him bound. When we say that Jesus rose from the dead, we are talking about Jesus' bodily resurrection. So let me be very clear about this. We aren't saying that Jesus is alive in our minds, in our hearts, in our memories. We aren't saying he has some sort of immortal soul. We are saying that it is fact that Jesus' physical body was raised from the dead to life by the power of God. And if that happened to him, it can happen to me. It can happen to me. For all those who confess that Jesus Christ is both Lord and Savior. This wasn't a resuscitation. For Guys, come on. It's so preposterous resuscitation like jesus resuscitated just imagine him giving cpr to himself it wasn't like jesus came back to life in a way that we would just to, to die again this right here was a physical resurrection the rising of jesus is jesus christ to the immortal splendor of a body that could never die again The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not only a giant stamp of approval of the price that was paid on the cross for me, for your wretched treachery on Good Friday, but it's also a reminder to me that when I die, my body will be resurrected too. There is so much hope in Easter. It's not just about getting candy. It's not just about spending time with family and eating more food than you should. Easter is a joyous time because it reminds me of the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. A hope that cannot be taken away. A hope that can go further and does not get affected by rust. Can't be stolen from me. Can't be taken from me. Can't break apart. It is an everlasting hope. It is not a hope in saying, I wish this vaccine would work. It is a fundamental, always going to happen hope. Jesus Christ rose again. 
And God sent the angels to say, Jesus is alive. He knew that the woman would be in the wrong place on this first Easter morning. Think about that. He knew it. He knew that they would go there. Looking for the living among the dead. So he graciously sends these messengers to tell them of the good news of the gospel. And I am so thankful for how God graciously does this. Because this is me. How often have we gone to the wrong place? He is there ahead of us, pointing us back in the right direction. God sends angels to tell these women and us today that Jesus is in the grave any longer. He is alive. So let me ask you then, how could the woman know that this was true? How could they know that they were looking for something in the wrong place? See, as far as the women were concerned, as far as they knew, Jesus died on the cross shortly before, a couple days before. How could they believe in the resurrection of his body unless they could see Jesus with their own eyes? More importantly, how can we believe this? If this is true, then how can we know for sure that Jesus really did rise from the dead? So how do the angels convince these women that Jesus is indeed risen from the dead? There's all sorts of different ways you could do this, right? They could give all of the empirical and physical evidence you need. You know, give them a list. You know, go to the DNA, you know, CSI thing. And do what they got to do. But the angels don't point to the physical evidence. They don't even try to explain by arguing all of the other possibilities. You know what they say? In verse 6, he is not here. He has risen. Remember. Remember how he told you. While he was still in Galilee, remember that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. The angel simply told these women and us today to remember what Jesus said. That Jesus keeps his promises. He always keeps his promises. We are to believe in the resurrection on the basis of what Jesus said. The empty tomb is not self-explanatory. There is a word that explains the deed, and this word is the gospel message that Jesus not only died, but that he also rose again with a glorious and everlasting body that would never die again. The angels told the woman to remember what he had said. Jesus made a promise. And he told them on the third day that he would rise again. We see this promise in Luke 9, verse 22, which says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. That's exactly what happened. And on the third day, be raised. The gospel is true. And when the women saw the empty tomb, they should have known that Jesus was alive from the dead, so why did they not believe? Verse 4 says the women were perplexed. The reason they were this is that they just didn't believe what Jesus said. Isn't this often the case with you and me? Unless and until we believe in the word of God, Life is all too perplexing. But when we do believe, everything starts to fall into place. It doesn't matter how much evidence there is. In order to come to Jesus, you must believe what Jesus said. I don't care if you can teach a PhD class in the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ or lack thereof. I don't care. You still have to believe what Jesus said. All those things are good. Okay, they're good. But you need to believe about what Jesus said. This is how we know for sure. By believing the gospel promise that Jesus died and that he rose again. Remember what Jesus said. He would be crucified to atone for our sins and be raised again uh, forever for eternal life. If we believe this, God will forgive our sins. Raise our bodies from the grave and give us an everlasting joy that can never be taken away, that rust cannot affect, that cannot be stolen, that cannot break. 
the women do believe, eventually. And that pushes them to do something even better. Have you found what you're looking for? As we continue on in verses 8 to 10, we see how the disciples respond. When we look at this narrative, how do people respond to the saving message of the gospel? Because the women do believe. They hear the words of the angel, and then the next thing that they do is they go and tell the other 11, because Judas has killed himself, so he's not there. So there's only 11. And they go tell him, Hey, two angels showed up to us. We went to the grave, the tomb. Nothing's there. The stone was rolled away. Nothing was there. The body's empty. There's no body. The grave's empty. Two angels came to us, and they just said, Remember. Remember. And what do the apostles respond with? They think they're crazy. But you can see their perplexity falling from their eyes like shingles off of their eyes. They can now see. These godly women had followed Jesus almost from the very beginning, and they had supported him throughout his earthly ministry. They had heard his teaching and could remember what he said. As soon as they remembered his words, they weren't perplexed anymore. Well, how did that happen? Well, Jesus said it would. He understood why the tomb was empty. Jesus was not among the dead, but among the living. He had risen from the grave. How are you responding to the resurrection? This was the best of all possible news. It meant that they would see Jesus again. It meant that God had won the total victory over sin and death. Where we can sing, O death, where is your sting? It meant that when they died, they would live again with God. Such news was too good to keep for themselves. So they immediately run and they find the other disciples and everybody else that's with them who followed Christ. And they told all of what they had heard and seen and became the first to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the way to respond to it. By remembering what Jesus said, believing what Jesus did, and then going telling other people about it. Our Savior rose from the dead. He came to heal the brokenhearted, to reconcile the lost to God. This is not what we need more now than ever. You know, you and I, we're just called to be showers and tellers of the resurrection. It's a show and tell every day. We don't twist arms. And and the glorious thing is about this is I'm not smart enough to come up with all the philosophical arguments. But what I can remember, Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And let me tell you about that. Let me tell you about why he died. Let me tell you that he didn't just like become unconscious and kind of like fall. He died. Not only that, he was buried for three days and the tomb was empty. It was gone. There's nothing there. The apostles respond to these women with, they thought that their words were idle tales and they did not believe it. The word idle tales just means the apostles thought they were crazy. That they were so overcome with grief that their minds were not right. How could this possibly happen? It's the idea that they were so grieved by what happened to Jesus that has gotten into their head. The disciples simply did not believe that Jesus was risen from the dead. Think about that today though. Doesn't this happen all the time? Maybe this is happening to you right now. Maybe some guy woke you up early, not really early, but you think it's early, in the morning and dragged you to church this day. Maybe you haphazardly stumbled upon us online and you're watching this. And you're thinking, what's this crazy guy talking about? You think it might be a good idea to join online or maybe that person dragged you out of bed and brought you to church. You're not alone. Many, many people think that the Bible is a fairy tale but I know you are searching for something. I know you're looking in all sorts 
of places to fill that hole. And none of them are working. I know. I was there too. You're looking for that satisfaction in anything but the one who died for your sins and three days later rose again. So how are you responding to Jesus' resurrection? For those of you who have loved ones and pray for them that they will come to Jesus, it gives us reason for hope. The disciples didn't believe it. You ever think about this? The people that walked with Jesus for three years did not get it. Like the disciples, they may still come through their unbelief and into faith in Jesus Christ, so we continue to pray. This also encourages us in our doubts, doesn't it? It's hope for me. If you are not sure that Jesus rose from the dead, we can still hope that God will grant us the gift of faith so that we may believe in Jesus and be saved. Verse 12 gives those who doubt an example to follow because I love Peter. I'm a Peter. Always putting your mouth, foot in your mouth, always saying things you shouldn't. Oftentimes denying. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping in and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves and he went home marveling at what has happened. The rest of the disciples didn't believe what the women were saying, but Peter went out to find out for himself. Think about who Peter was. A few days before, he denied Jesus. Not once, not twice, but three times. Doing exactly the thing that Jesus told him he would do. Yet he still said, no, I'm not going to do it. And as he denied Jesus, as Jesus was watching him, denying him, what are the things that are probably flowing through his mind as he hears this account of the woman saying he is risen? How do you think Peter was feeling? Talk about hopelessness. He denied Jesus. Denied him. Everything, everything that he had said before almost didn't mean nothing. Every time that he said he would die for Jesus meant nothing. When some servant girl came up to him and said, hey, didn't you belong to Jesus? And he's like, no, not me. What were the things that were running through his mind? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Is there, is there solid hope of a bodily resurrection for everyone who believes in him? Even me? Is there any chance? Peter must have wondered that someone who denied the Christ might still be forgiven. But Jesus rose from the dead, and the answer to all of that is yes. As we saw on Good Friday, even Jesus, in Jesus' weakest of states, he's able to save a thief on the cross. And Jesus rising from the dead is proof. Jesus rising from the dead is God's giant stamp of approval on what he did as he rose him from the dead. Jesus was resurrected on the third day and appeared to many of his disciples to prove it. By being raised from the dead, God made clear that the full price of sins had been paid by his son. Now the only thing that's left for people like you and me is to respond to that good news. The message of the gospel is not information, but a call to obedience. We are supposed to do something when we hear the good news of Jesus Christ. We are to repent. We are to agree with God that we are sinners. We are to renounce our sins and turn back on our old life and to believe to put our full confidence in the person of Jesus Christ. Because he is our substitute, whose death was enough to rescue us from the hell we deserve. So what do we do with all this? You may ask yourself, what we see here is not just words. The testimony of what we see here demands something of us. And I don't want you here leaving today without first doing this. 
Have you carefully considered the claims of Christ? Have you honestly investigated the empty tomb? As Peter did, he, found, he, finds, <clears throat> he finds out whether Jesus rose from the dead. You know, so many people refuse to take the trouble, and I pray that that's not you. Have you examined the evidence? In his gospel, Luke was written an orderly and reliable eyewitness of historical accounts of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He reported challenges, his report challenges us to reach out our own decisions as to whether Jesus is among the living or the dead. There are many good reasons to believe that Jesus is alive. We could go through them all. There is evidence of history starting with the empty tomb himself. Where did Jesus' body go if, it did not, if he did not rise from the grave and ascend to heaven? There is also existence of the church. The very fact that we are here on an Easter morning is evidence of the work of God. Just that. How did the first Christians recover from their despair over death? of Jesus so quickly and change the world in so many ways, if not by the power of the risen Christ. The very man who denied Jesus three days, bef- or three days before is a man who stands up and God uses this broken, uneducated man to save 3,000 people. How does one man go from such despair of understanding that he denied Jesus to standing up amongst a big crowd of people without something changing in his mind, without a solid faith and a solid hope? How does that same man walk in with another disciple and walk into the face of the religious leaders and acts and get beaten for declaring the good news of Jesus Christ? And then they ask him a question. They say to him, you can't preach anymore. And his response is, who am I supposed to obey, you or God? Folks, we're walking into a world where we're going to have to make some major decisions as to what we're going to stand for. And it starts here. Did Jesus rise from the dead? If he did, it changes everything. It changes how we live. It changes how we interact with other people. It it causes us and pushes us out to declare the good news of Jesus Christ. Good Friday shows us how much our sin and our treachery is to God. That God provided payment. And as Jesus rose from the dead, he get, God gives his giant stamp of approval for the price that had been paid. Will you accept that payment? It's like we've talked about today with family worship with Dave. You cannot be saved by works. Will you accept the payment? If you don't, the price still has to be paid. The debt still has to be paid. And it only gets paid by eternity in hell because that's how long it takes to pay back the treachery you've done against the holy, infinite God. But praise be to God for his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross who absorbed the full wrath of God so that when I confess my sin, when I repent my sin, and when I believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, his righteousness is imputed upon me. I am deserving of that punishment, but Christ takes it on my behalf. And when I look at the resurrection, that's me too. Do you believe his words or not? Have you found what you're looking for? Because Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. It all comes back to the gospel words of Jesus. Do you believe what he said or not? Like children scattered around the yard for Easter eggs, you and I are on a hunt. We're all hunting. Our thirsty souls rummage through every nook and cranny of this world in search of of all the shiny pleasures that it has to offer. If you're that person, if you're that type of person who's putting all their joy into things that get old and fade or rust or break or might get stolen, 
you need to pay very careful attention to Easter. And like I said, not like the nod off through the sermon kind of attention, but a real earnest, eager attention because the word of God also makes a promise, seek and you will find. It makes a promise if you truly are seeking, God will show himself to you. It's a promise. Just like Jesus promised that he would die and three days later rose again, and he did. It's the same promise. If we miss the significance of this day, the resurrection, we scamper past the greatest joy in this universe. Have you found what you're looking for today? Let's continue to praise God. Father God, we just thank you for who you are and what you have done. Lord, I pray that we would see you for who you are, that you are God, that not only did you die for my sins, but three days later you rose again. I pray for all of those who are here who don't, or who are not resting in that, who aren't, uh, who have not repented of their sin, who aren't believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who aren't leaning into the promises of the gospel. I pray that you would convict them. God, if I may be so bold, I pray that you would not let them rest so that they may see you as the source of all rest. I pray that you would send your holy hound over them. Convict them by your word, Lord. Call them to yourself. But God, I pray for those of us who are resting in you that this would be a sign for us of what you have called us to do, that we've been called to be disciples who make disciples of Jesus Christ. May we go out into this world declaring your goodness that Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. And amen.